Hi guys. Large prime numbers have many purposes throughout mathematics and cybersecurity, but how do people check if they are prime in the first place? In this video, I am going to be talking about the miller rabin primality test, which is one of, if not the, most common and useful ways to check and find prime numbers in practice. We will go through an explanation of what the test is, and a detailed proof of its ability to consistently let the user distinguish between prime numbers and composite numbers with ease. So, let's get started. First of all, it is important to understand that the miller rabin test isn't a completely traditional approach to checking the primality of numbers. The test can never prove that a number is prime, only that a number is not prime. However, we will see that the test is so good at proving numbers are not prime, that if it fails to do that several times in a row, it is basically a safe guess to assume that the number in question is indeed a prime. Now, for the rest of the video, choose some whole number in to which we are going to be applying the miller rabin test. We will ignore the cases where n is even or a perfect power for technical reasons in the specifics of the proof. Luckily, as determining the primality of even numbers or perfect powers is basically trivial, ignoring such cases isn't really that big of a problem. Now, the miller rabin test is probabilistic. At the start of the test, we choose some random number c in the multiplicative group z over nz star. Of course, if we happen to choose a non-zero c that isn't in the multiplicative group, this instantly proves that n isn't prime, so we can just choose a random c and ignore that case, because we're already done if that happens. Now what the test is going to do is it's going to check a certain property of c and n, which we will go into detail on later. And importantly, if n is in fact prime, then this property is guaranteed to hold. If it does hold, then the test returns could be prime. Of course, it's still possible that we made a bad choice of c and that n is actually a composite number. On the other hand, if our special property does not hold, then therefore n cannot be a prime number, and our test can confidently return a 100% certain result of not prime. In this case, we are going to call c a witness that n is a composite number, because it is demonstrating the compositeness of n. Again, the crucial idea here, and we will rigorously justify this later in the video, is that if n is not prime, then by repeating the miller rabin test several times with random choices for c, it is extremely likely that one of those choices for c is going to be a witness to m not being prime, and the test is going to therefore return not prime at least once. As such, if no witness to n being composite is found after, say, 100 attempts, then it is pretty safe to conclude that n is in fact a prime and no witness to it being composite even exists. Also, just really quick, the main source I'm using for this video, especially for the main proof we will be giving in our second result, is uh, this link here. It's a really cool paper. It took a really hard result to prove and found a proof that is more accessible than the other proofs I looked at for this video. So I just want to shout out that link. It's a very cool paper. And feel free to read it. Let's start by showing exactly what the special property of CNN we mentioned before is and by showing that as long as n is a prime number, that property is always going to be satisfied. Take our fixed n and write it as a times 2 to the power of b plus 1, where a is an odd number. Basically, what we have done is to just factor out all the 2s from n minus 1 until we are left with our odd number a. Now, choose some random c in z over nz star and fix it for the rest of the proof. We claim that if n is prime, then either c to the power of a is congruent to 1 modulo n, or c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i is congruent to negative 1 modulo n for some value of i from 0 to b minus 1. Let's prove that this is the case. c to the power of a times 2 to the power of b equals c to the power of n minus 1, which, by Fermat's little theorem, because again we're assuming n is prime here, is congruent to 1 modulo n. Now, if c to the a is congruent to 1 modulo n, then we are done. So, without loss of generality, c to the a is not congruent to 1. So, as i iterates from 0 to b, c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i eventually is going to switch from not being congruent to 1 to being congruent to 1. In other words, there is some i in 0 dot 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 b minus 1 such that c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i is not congruent to 1 but if we just add one more to i, then we get that c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i plus 1 is. So it basically does a little jump and switches. Now, if we define x to be equal to c to the power of 
a times two to the power of i, then what we see is that since x squared is c to the power of a times two to the power of i plus one, which we just said was one modulo n, we have that n is going to be dividing x squared minus one, which equals x plus one times x minus one. However, since x equals c to the power of a times two to the power of i, as we just said, and we also said that that was not congruent to one modulo n, then what we also have is that n does not divide x minus one. So therefore, by Euclid's lemma, which is a very important lemma, and what it says according to Wikipedia, is that if a prime p divides the product a, b of two integers a and b, then p must divide at least one of those integers a and b, then we get that n must divide x plus one. And what this means is that c to the power of a times two to the power of i is congruent to negative one modulo n, and so we are done. What we have just shown is a special set of criterion that must hold as long as n is a prime number. We will call these the miller rabin criterion for simplicity. Now, the important thing is that these criterion must hold for any choice of c in z over nz star. So if we can find even one value for c for which this does not hold, then we know that n must be a composite, and we can say that c is a witness to n being composite. Now, quickly, let's just do an example of the test in action to see how it would actually work in practice. Let's take n equal to 21 and c equal to 2. In this case, writing a and b how we originally defined them, a becomes 5 and b becomes 2. Now, as you can see here, the criterion are in fact not met. So therefore, we are guaranteed that n is not a prime number, and we say that c equals 2 is a witness to this fact. And indeed, 21, of course, is not prime, it is 3 times 7. Now, let's do a second example. Taking n equal to 23 and c equal to 3, then c to the power of a is in fact congruent to 1, so therefore the criterion r met, and we have that c is not a witness to n being prime. Therefore, 23 might be a prime number. However, importantly, we cannot conclude that 23 is a prime, as a test can never actually guarantee a number is prime, it can only guarantee a number is not prime. And, in fact, this time it was correct, 23 is indeed a prime number. Now, let's move on to our second result, and the hardest, yet most interesting, proof of this video. You might have noticed that so far, even if n is a composite number, we have no guarantee that our test is going to be able to detect that. What we are missing is a lower bound on the number of witnesses for compositeness. So, to address this, we fix some composite number n. Again, no even numbers or perfect powers are going to be allowed. And we're going to write it as before as 2 to the power of b times a plus 1 with a an odd number. At this point, for all we know, n might just unluckily have very few witnesses to it being composite, or even none at all. We have no guarantee on this yet. And if this was the case, the compositeness of n would be undetectable by the miller raven test, and we'd kind of be screwed. Luckily, this can never happen. In fact, at least three quarters of the possible choices for c and z over nz star are going to be witnesses. However, we will prove the slightly weaker statement that at least 50% are witnesses. Since we can repeat the test as many times as we want to get an arbitrarily high chance of detecting a composite number, the exact proportion doesn't really matter that much, and showing 50% are witnesses will suffice for basically every intent and purpose of the miller raven primality test. So let's prove this result. First of all, consider the set of equations x to the 1 is congruent to negative 1, x to the 2 is congruent to negative 1, x to the 4 is congruent to negative 1, etc., all the way up to x to the power of 2 to the power of b minus 1 is congruent to negative 1. Now, the first equation has a trivial solution, namely just set x equal to negative 1. So therefore, there exists some maximal j such that x to the power of 2 to the power of j is negative 1, and let's fix this j. Now, consider the subset g of z over nz star, which is defined as the element c such that c to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is either equal to 1 or negative 1. Now, this might seem like a random choice to define a set, but we will see that's actually quite useful for our proof. In fact, we are now going to prove three facts about G. First of all, we claim that if C is not a witness that N is composite, then C is going to be an element of G. In other words, we are going to show that G contains all non-witnesses for the compositeness of N. To prove fact one, choose some such C and note that since c is not a witness, then either c to the power of a is congruent to 1 
or c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i is negative 1 for some i from 0 to b minus 1. Now, in the first case, we have that c to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is equal to c to the power of a to the power of 2 to the power of j, which is indeed congruent to 1 to the power of 2 to the power of j, which is 1. So in that case, we're done. On the other hand, if c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i is congruent to negative 1 for some i, then that means that c to the power of a is a solution to the equation x to the power of 2 to the power of i is congruent to negative 1. So therefore, by how we defined j, we know that j is either greater than or equal to i. So, in fact, c to the power of a times 2 to the power of j, we can rewrite as c to the power of a times 2 to the power of i to the power of 2 to the power of j minus i which is congruent to negative 1 to the power of 2 to the power of j minus i, which is going to be plus 1 if j is strictly greater than i, and negative 1 if j is equal to i. Therefore, by looking at all these cases and doing casework, we can conclude that no matter which of these cases that we've talked about occurs, we see c to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is plus or minus 1, so fact 1 is indeed true. Secondly, we must prove that G is a subgroup of Z over NZ star. First of all, note that if C and D are some elements of G, then C to the power of A times 2 to the power of J is plus or minus 1, and also D to the power of A times 2 to the power of J is also plus or minus 1. So therefore, C times D to the power of A times 2 to the power of J is C to the power of A times 2 to the power of J times D to the power of A times 2 to the power of J which is plus or minus 1 times plus or minus 1, which, of course, is just going to be plus or minus 1. So therefore, we see that g is indeed closed under multiplication. Also, c inverse to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is equal to c to the power of a times 2 to the power of j inverse, which is congruent to the inverse of plus or minus 1, which is indeed plus or minus 1. So therefore, we see that g also contains inverses. And by group theory, these two facts together indeed imply that G is a subgroup of Z over NZ star. The third and final fact that we are going to be showing is that G is a strictly smaller subgroup of Z over NZ star. In other words, we must find some element W in Z over NZ star that is not inside of G. To do this, first let's choose some prime number P that divides N. Now, write n equal to g times p to the power of h, where p does not divide g. Now, note that since we assumed that n is a composite number, and that it is not a perfect power, the only way this can work out is if g is not equal to 1. So therefore, g is larger than 1. Now, remember that x to the power of 2 to the power of j is negative 1, or congruent to negative 1, has at least one solution by the definition of j. And let's call the solution x naught. Now, by the Chinese remainder theorem, there is some w in z over nz with w congruent to x naught modulo p to the power of h and congruent to 1 modulo g. Again, this follows because p to the power of h and g are coprime, since we said that g is not divisible by p. And since x naught shares no common factor with n, it shares no common factor with p to the power of h, and so, from the first equation, w doesn't either. From the second equation, we see that w and g share no factors. Now, putting these two things together, we see, in fact, that w and n don't have any common factors. And so, therefore, w is, in fact, not only in z over nz, it's in z over nz star. Also, since w and x naught are congruent modulo p to the power of h, w to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is congruent to x naught to the power of a times 2 to the power of j too. But x naught to the power of a times 2 to the power of j equals x naught to the power of 2 to the power of j to the power of a, which is congruent to negative 1 to the power of a module n, which is negative 1 since a is odd. Remember that we assumed n is odd at the beginning, so therefore a has to be odd because a divides n. Um, and so therefore, x naught to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is congruent to negative 1 modulo p to the power of h. So we have that w to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is also congruent to negative 1 modulo p to the power of h. And furthermore, w to the power of a times 2 to the power of j is congruent to 1 to the power of a times 2 to the power of j modulo g, which is 1. Now, 
the fact that w to the power of a times t to the power of j is congruent to negative 1 modulo p to the power of h implies that it is not congruent to 1 modulo p to the power of h. So w to the power of a times t to the power of j is not congruent to 1 modulo n. And since w to the power of a times t to the power of j is congruent to 1 modulo g, it is not congruent to negative 1 modulo g. So it isn't congruent to negative 1 modulo n either. Putting these two facts together gives that w to the power of a times 2 to the power of g is not plus or minus 1 modulo n. So therefore, w is not an element of g as desired. Now that we have proved our three facts, we can use them to show that at least half of elements in z over nz star are witnesses. By Lagrange's theorem, the order of g divides the order of z over nz star, so the order of z over nz star over the order of g is a whole number. But since g is strictly smaller than z over nz star, this number cannot be equal to 1. So since this whole number, it must be at least 2. So therefore, g contains at most half the elements in z over nz star. However, since every non-witness for n being composite is contained in g, this therefore implies that at most half the elements of z over nz star are non-witnesses. So, therefore, at least half the elements of z over nz star are witnesses as desired, and the result is proven. We have shown that, given some composite number n, at least half the choices for c are witnesses, so the Miller-Rabin test is going to determine that n is composite at least 50% of the time, as each time just using c randomly. Now, if we run the test k times for some fixed number k, then since each time the test outputs that n is composite at least 50% of the time, we can expect that at most a probability of one half to the power of k the test is going to fail to determine the compositeness of n over those k trials. And as an example, if k was equal to 100, this is going to translate to 0 0.000, uh, many, many zeros, 788% chance for the test to never return n as composite. Therefore, in such a scenario where the test failed 100 times in a row to say that n was composite, it is more or less completely safe to assume that n is indeed a prime number. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that now you understand how, despite the factorization of large numbers being infamously hard to do, we can easily determine whether smaller factors of some number exist in the first place without even having a good way to figure out what they are, which is pretty cool in and of itself. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Bye.